Hello and welcome to what will be a bit of a whirlwind as we enter the turbulent seas of the Odyssey. In this first Odyssey video, what I want to do is not so much introduce the poem as one of my what are one of the lines that I think is the most important to understanding it. Um, we're going to focus quite a bit on just one small moment in book four in order to think through this issue. And later videos will cover issues such as the Telemachy and the exploration. But for now, please join me, Dr. Christian Lehman, on Homer's Odyssey Book Four, Race and Resource Extraction. Uh, and we'll be using, for the couple of passages that we have, the translation by Emily Wilson, which is this very beautiful object. In the start of the poem, in book one, one of the first things that we learn is that Poseidon is off in Ethiopia. But now the distant Ethiopians who lived between the sunset and the dawn were worshiping the sea god with a feast, a hundred cattle and a hundred rams. There sat the god delighting in his banquet. Odyssey one, lines 22 to 26. And the reason that I'm emphasizing this is because although Odysseus's wanderings are going to take him all around the Mediterranean, um, and specifically just like kind of the, the coastal regions there in the islands. Nonetheless, Ethiopia is a place that exists, right? And you shouldn't think about it with the modern um, borders, of a, if you look at a map of Ethiopia today, but rather large location in Africa. One of the reasons I wanna emphasize that is this is not a like, Hellenocentric poem, right? It involves all of the Mediterranean. And so we should think about it in that terms. So this brings me to one of the issues that I want to make sure is kind of forefront in your mind as we um, think about another thing that happens here uh, later in book four. This is book four. In Sparta, Telemachus has arrived um, for the Real Housewives of Sparta, Menelaus and Helen edition. He's there with his best boy pal, Pisistratus, and he looks around. Telemachus turned round to Nestor's son, ducking his head so no one else could hear. Pisistratus, dear friend, do you see how these echoing halls are shining bright with bronze and silver, gold and ivory and amber? It is full of riches. It is as full of riches as the palace of Zeus on Mount Olympus. I am struck with awe. Right? So he's seeing bronze, silver, gold, ivory, and amber. When Menelaus heard these words, he spoke to them in turn, his words flew out. No mortal, my dear boys, can rival Zeus. His halls and home and property are deathless. Some man may match my wealth, or maybe not. I suffered for it. I was lost adrift at sea for eight long years. I traipsed through Cyprus, Phoenicia, Egypt, Ethiopia, Sidon, Araby, and Libya, where lambs are born with horns. Their ewes give birth three times a year. And then he goes on. The master and his slave have milk and cheese and meat. The flock provides sweet milk year round. But while I wandered there accumulating wealth, someone crept in and killed my brother. His own scheming wife betrayed him. I can take no joy in all my wealth, whoever they may be. Your fathers have surely told you how much I have suffered. I lost my lovely home and I was parted for many years from all my splendid riches. I wish I had stayed here with just a third of the treasures I have now acquired. If those who died at Troy so far away from Argive pastures were alive and well. So the line that I think is the most crucial line to understand this version of the Mediterranean, is while I wandered there accumulating wealth. I'm going to pull two passages up here and let's look at this map. I suffered for it. I traipsed through Cyprus, right? So Cyprus. So again, uh, we'll cover, cover that in a second. Cyprus through Phoenicia, which is here, down into Egypt, which is here, Ethiopia, um, and then Libya. In Araby, right? So going all around um, and it says, while I wandered there accumulating wealth. So this language is a little bit passive. Uh, and then he goes back to Sparta, right? So think about this. Menelaus and his men have been here in Troy, 
in the eastern reach of what is now modern day Turkey, fighting a war for 10 years. Right, so these are battle hardened men that he's traveling with. And then he says, wandered accumulating wealth through these locations. Well, what's he doing? He is extracting resources, all right? So this is different than colon colonization because he's not stopping and setting up habitation. Instead, he's arriving with his band of hardened warriors, trained elite soldiers. He's going to these places and he's stealing their wealth, right? Look back at what it was that he took. Bronze, silver, gold, ivory, and amber. Ivory and amber in particular should stand out to you. Um, all right, so what, what is this? This is, of course, plunder. And plunder gets fetishized as something that's worth accumulating. But what gets erased is the populations from whom you have stolen this, right? This is a similar idea of what like museums do. Like, you're not supposed to question where objects came from when you walk into a museum. But essentially, if you walk into a museum and you go, wow, you're doing what Isistratus and Telemachus are doing. You're staring at the plundered, resource extracted wealth of an individual. Stolen, all right? And which populations are they stolen from? Mediterranean populations um, and ones that have like multiracial and multi-ethnic populations. And the reason I wanna emphasize that is to show that there's the, all of this circulation that happens. So I wanna talk about this briefly in light of um, a Twitter kind of a, a blow up that happened in September of 2020, where an artist posted really kind of amazing uh, pictures of Roman poets and pictured them with dark skin and um, white supremacists came out of the woodwork to say that um, Romans and people in uh, Greece and Rome were white, when of course they were not. They were multi-ethnic and multiracial. So as Venus has said, there were brown people in ancient Rome, which was a multicultural empire. And so artistic depictions of, yes, even aristocratic poets, where they have dark skin are fine and people need to calm the F down. This is the original tweet that started it all. Um, Brittany, uh, her, her depictions of these fellows so here on the left is her depiction of Catullus. And then in the villa of Catullus, the so-called villa of Catullus, this is actually a depiction of a fellow there on the wall that dates from the Roman period. Um, very clearly, you can see he has melatonin. Again, what I wanna emphasize is that like these populations are circulating and anybody that tries to claim Greco-Roman antiquity as white is perpetuating white supremacist discourse. And you should have the ability to say no. And one of the things that I'm doing right now is trying to give you the tools to do that. So one of the first pieces of evidence that she uses here is the Fayum mummy portraits. Uh, when it comes to elite Roman representation, why is it more seemly to look at modern day Italians rather than the iconography from Roman Egypt? So here we are, this is where the Fayum is, in, according to, uh, not according to, the, that is where the Fayum is. Uh, and you'll notice it's very, it's close to the Mediterranean. It's close, in fact, to this region through which Menelaus passed while he was doing his plunder. So quickly on a Fayum mummy portrait, what it is, is it's a plank of wood that's been painted and placed on top of the, the mummy. And so it is an idealized depiction. That's also important to emphasize. Like people have found um, with studying the human remains that often the face might not match the, the image. And so it, it is idealized and it's idealized with dark skin with brown skin. Um, and so again, saying like, this is the populations that lived here and they're mingling, right? They're constantly moving back and forth, whether that's in, in trade, in slavery, in battle, any of these things, right? So populations are mixed. Um, here's another example, um, a, a word that you should know is polychromy. Uh, I think it's more euphemist to say polychromy, but people have been saying polychromy. Uh, and this is that ancient statues and art are multicultural, multicolored. They're not the pure white marble that we've been taught to associate them with, and by default, to associate Greeks and Romans with whiteness. So there's um, a scholar 
Sarah Bond, who's quite active on Twitter, who also has been writing about this a lot lately. And here's just um, a quick uh, example. This is from Aphaya in Greece, um, 5th century BCE. And you see here this fellow, that's how we see him today, but by looking at the, the evidence, you could reconstruct the multicolored pajamas and even a bit of the patina of the skin. Um, one of the things that happened in the 17th and 18th century, as you start getting a really um, kind of reinforced embrace of white supremacy in Europe, is they actually polished and used acid to make the statues even whiter than they were. Which again, it lays some of the groundwork for these ideas. Um, a last quick example, the Riachi bronzes, um, which uh, are bronze, but then they were also painted. And so by examining that paint, you can see the original brown tones that they have. So, and then the last example that I have for you is a Janiform vessel. This is a two-handed wine glass that depicts um, on the left an African male and then a uh, Greek woman. Um, again, both of them um, are not white. So that's a key thing to emphasize. I know this video has been quite repetitive, but as you read this poem, The Odyssey, I just wanna emphasize it's not about um, a bunch of only white people, right? So think about this poem as exploring multiculturalism and multi-ethnicities. It has a Hellenocentric point of view. Like it will argue for like the superiority of these Greeks, right? That phrase that we looked at with Menelaus, there's no critique of what Menelaus is doing. We have to read the poem in order to see how it presents those ideas of dominance and in turn celebrates them. And then we can approach it from our perspective in order to say that that's how the poem works. The ideology that the poem is laying out doesn't need to be our ideology, even though that idea of like Odysseus's and Menelaus's superiority over Troy led directly into a sense that, oh, they are white. And then that led to a sense that white supremacy was a model. So um, we'll do some more of this um, kind of work with my next video and our next lecture on the Cyclops and Odysseus's wandering.